That scares even me. I, it is scary when you sit back and you look at yourself and you see yourself maybe as, as others do. You come to that realization of just who am I really? Dan was reading from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. And uh, if he were to continue uh, into verse 13, but now by faith, hope, love. Remember in January, we had our yearly praise, uh, prayer, and proclamation day. And we used those three words as the key. We said how they're going to be words that we're going to be coming back to throughout the year. Well, in a sense, that's what we're coming back to. The idea of hope. The idea of love. The idea of faith. Because we have the ardent love for God, do we hold on to the faith? Do we still have that hope that kindles in us? And if so, what then sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct? Because truly, we want to know who we are and what we're about. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would please, into 1 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. And we're going to begin reading in verse 3. Now, normally I would read from the New American Standard translation, but I'm going to read from the Amplified for a moment. In verse 3, it says, But as for me personally, it matters very little to me that I should be put on trial by you on this point, and that you or any other human tribunal should investigate and question, cross-question me. I do not even put myself on trial and judge myself. I am conscious of anything against myself. And I feel blameless, but I am not vindicated and acquitted before God on that account. It is the Lord himself who examines and judges me. Verse 5. So do not make any hasty or premature judgments before the time when the Lord comes again. For he will both bring to light the secret things that are now hidden in darkness and in disclose and expose the secret aims, motives, and purposes of hearts. Then every man will receive his due condemnation from God. Whew. A lot of reading there for two verses. But notice the word when I said I was reading from the Amplified Translation. It is expansive, really expansive. It adds to it so much. But how did yours read? Yours read a little bit more truncated, to be sure. But to me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. I am conscious, and I want you to hold that word conscious in your thoughts for just a moment. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man will uh, each man's praise will come to him from God. Well, what's really going on? What's going on is that Paul is talking about how important it is that we come to the brutal honesty of really knowing ourselves. Wow. That's frightening. To really see ourselves. Now, since the first of the year, we've been talking about this theme a little bit, about really coming to grips 
with who we are, what we're about. Paul talked about in 1 Timothy, first chapter, verse 13. He said, I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy. Paul said, that's who I was. It's not who I am now. Paul, in his introspection, saw himself as the foremost of all sinners. But he found forgiveness. He repented, was obedient, and aligned himself with the God of heaven. See, that's what the gospel calls for. The gospel calls that we would be repentant, that we would examine ourselves and see where we need to make the corrections and then to make those corrections. In Luke 13, verse 3, I tell ye nay, but unless you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There it goes. All perish. That repentance is so very vital. So in essence of all that we're about. But what does the word repent mean? The word repent means to have a change of mind about, to be sorry for, and to turn away from. But remember I asked you about the word conscious. And I told you just to kind of set it aside. Now I realize that it's kind of small today for whatever reason. But the word conscience, to know, comes from the root word of conscience, which carries knowledge of self. When somebody loses consciousness and awakes, they are asked if they know their name. In other words, who are you? Who are you? A long time ago, I was with some friends. And we had been up for days, it seemed like. We had gone backpacking in Yosemite, had done the half dome hike, and we had parked our cars up on Glacier Point. So we did half dome, came back down to the Merced River, and then started up Glacier Point. Got back to our cars, realized what day it was and where we needed to be. So beat feet it into the cars, drove hours upon hours, got to where we were going and we got in there and I remember standing up from a table and all of a sudden I don't remember anything else. And then the next thing I remember was, do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? Yeah, what happened? What happened? Are you aware of yourself? Of how you got to this point. That's what Paul's talking about. When he talks about conscience. Do you really know who you are? Have you come to grips with who you are? Do you really know yourself? And that's what we're talking about. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. That's the key. Of really coming to grips with who you are. And what you know and how you know it. And the cognizance therein. So when you begin to think about it. It's vital to everything that we're about. Let me share with you a few quotes. Swenborg, who is a noted philosopher, pointed out conscience is God's presence in man. George Washington, that little spark of celestial fire, conscience. Marcus Aurelius said, if anyone can demonstrate to me, convince me that I am thinking or acting incorrectly, I will happily change. For I wish to know the truth, which never causes injury to anyone. End of quote. Well, that's exactly what the scriptures do. And that is why the scriptures 
are referred to as the mirror. That's what James talks about, the mirror of God's word. We look at it. We look deeply at it. We find our imperfections. We find our flaws. As we get older, we find things that we really don't like. I realize that I've got scars on my head. Back when my hair was down here a little bit more, before I decided to take a vacation, uh, this scar here was not as pronounced. But I also noticed that I'm getting a lump here. And I go, I haven't had that lump there before. And then I'm getting something here, something there. And I got this big thing right here that I try to push back. But it's who we are. And the mirror doesn't lie to us. Nor does the mirror of God's word lie to us. And that's what we're talking about. How does, how does God see us? It's one thing how we try to portray ourselves. But how does God see us? Aristotle said, even the tiniest initial deviation from the truth is subsequently multiplied a thousandfold. So when I look at God's word and I see where I deviate from it, the ramifications are truly, truly immense. The language of truth is always simple and unadorned. That I don't like. I don't like that one. Because I want to put some in, I want to put some fringes. I want to put some embellishments where I may not be quite what I ought to be in regards to the God of heaven. But I can't do that. And there are advantages to really coming to knowing ourselves. And quite honestly, there are disadvantages as well. Look at 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And drop in at verse 11. For who among man knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God... No one knows except the Spirit of God. I get myself in a lot of trouble <clears throat> when I begin to think that I know what people are thinking, and especially one person in particular. Even though I've known her over 50 years, it is presumptuous and dangerous on my part to think that I know what Linda's thinking. I got to stop it. Haven't stopped it for over 50 years, but I got to stop it. Because I don't know what she's thinking. No one can know what goes on in the mind of another. And so I've got to look to myself. And I've got to determine what I'm about. My responsibility in that regards is to me. And we can only know what others want us to know about them. There's a lot going on in Austin's mind. Sometimes we think probably not, but there's a lot going on in his mind. And Austin chooses to let us know what he's about. Same thing with me. I choose to let you know what I'm about. But there are certain things I choose not to. You don't know where I stand politically. And there's a reason why I don't let you know that. I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. You know that much. I'm not a libertarian. I keep saying I'm confused. The longer you know me, the more you know I am confused. But there's one thing I am not confused on, and none of us can be confused with, and that is the truth that emanates from God's word. So what I've got to do is I've got to look inside of myself. I've got to come to grips with who I am and what I'm about. 
And I've got to see me as God sees me. Not some, some sugar-coated uh, fixation that I want to put out for man. But I want to be seen as God sees me. If you go back into 2 Samuel, and if you look in at um, the 16th chapter, you find something rather interesting back there. Because what you find there is that God does not look at the externals. God looks at the heart. And so it was when you go back and you see they were trying to select one to be king. And David was not even brought before. Oh, he's too pretty looking. He's too frail. He's not the type that would make a good king. No. God said, that's the one I want. Because I am concerned with the heart and nothing else. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I long for. The confrontation as to who you truly are. And it's not up to other people necessarily to do it. But initially it resides with you. And you've got to take you aside and you've got to look intently at the perfect law of liberty. Examine it and make the necessary corrections. Here's where I'm deficient. Here's where I need to be strengthened. Here's where I need to be bolstered. I don't need to be all veneer. I need to be solid. Linda watches a lot of the programs on, uh, what is that? Home and Garden? One of where they do all the fix-up programs and whatnot. And they go, well, we can do this the cheap way or the right way. Well, what's the cheap way? The cheap way is we throw a veneer over it. What's the right way? The right way is expensive. The right way is when we come in, we have to rip everything out. And we put back in that which is solid. That which is substantive. That which is going to hold. The truth. See, when we decide to put in something that isn't solid, that isn't substantive, it's only going to cause trouble in the long run. What was it? A few years ago, uh, there had to be a lot of recall of drywall. And it was drywall that had come from China. And there was some kind of way that they had manufactured it. And it radiated toxic fumes. And it was causing illness. And individuals that had hung it had to go back in, had to rip it out, and had to hang drywall that wasn't with contagion. On the outside, it looked like great drywall. Now, I don't know drywall the same way Randy does. I don't know veneer like Dan would. But you look beyond the outside coating. And that's what we have to do with self. Am I but a, a, a veneer of what I should be? Or from the inside to the outside, I am radiating what God would have me to be about. Look at Romans 14, verse 4. In Romans 14, 4, Paul writes, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. Stand he will. For the Lord is able to make him stand. Who am I in service to? I'm in service to the God of heaven. That is who I have to please. So I look at myself. And I say, am I pleasing in the sight of God? That's blunt honesty. I realize, Linda had the 
photo album out the other day. And we were looking for something specific. And I looked at the photos then, and I realize now, I no longer, I no longer am the man I was 50 years ago, 45 years ago. The individual that sat overlooking a, a lake, slim and spelt, flowing hair past my shoulders, robust beard. I'm not that guy anymore. Guy who could hike and climb mountains. I'm not him. Somewhere along the line, something happened. And so I have to look at myself now as I am. Am I going to be a used to good? Or am I going to recognize here's the reality of where I am? So I look at myself physically and I go, oh, I'm, I'm no longer that. But I look at myself internally. Here's where I was then. Where would I much rather be? The individual that has pressed on to maturity and realizes you're not there yet? And you've got a lot more work to do. God's not done with you. Or that individual that thought he had it all figured out. That life was just right there. I've got it figured out. I wasn't a Christian at the time. Had no clue. Thought I knew. Was studying Shintoism, Buddhism, any other ism that was not Christianity. I've got it figured out. I didn't even know the questions to ask. But now, after being a Christian for so long, can I sit back and say I made it? No. But what I have to constantly do is constantly be looking internally and being honest. And honesty, whoa. And really know myself. If you've got the time, I'll sit down and tell you all the faults that I got. If you really got the time. But then I can't do that because Austin told me earlier today, how long has it been since you've been quiet? So you ask me that question, I'm going to invoke the quiet rule. And just kind of look at you like this. And then you can blame Austin because Austin said, when was the last time you were quiet? And then he admitted after class. That the longest he's ever gone without talking is 30 minutes. And that was to get a Boy Scout badge. I've been quiet longer than that. When I got upset at somebody, I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't talk. But I say all that in jest. Because, yes, we do have to look at who we are. We do have to own up to our shortcomings and do it to ourselves. So that we can go forward better. Because what we want to do is we want to celebrate truth. We want to celebrate honesty in what we're about. Come on, flip over, flip over, dig, dig it. There it goes. This computer is real slow. We need to look internally and see what's going on with this silly computer. Know the truth and the truth shall set you free is what uh, John the 8th chapter verse 32 talks about. And truth must be about what we're about. I want to be set free. So I look intently here. And I look intently there to see where I need to change in here. To really know myself. To understand myself. Now Dan read from 1 John the first chapter earlier. Appreciated him reading that. Because as you read through it, you realize that not one of us can say that we haven't made. If we say that we have not sinned, we lie, and the truth is not in us. So we look at where our sin is. We look at where our shortcomings may be. And then we make the necessary changes. You know Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, so well. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That idea of transformation is ongoing. It is something that we are continually about. I was in the back part of the house yesterday. And we have a sliding door off the master bedroom. And it was open and I was looking outside. And I saw this most resplendent butterfly. And I was just thinking of the change that that butterfly underwent. And I watched it for quite a while. Beautiful. That's us. The metamorphosis, the change that's talked about there in Romans 12, 1 and 2 is exactly us. We go from that worm state. We go through the process of conversion. And it is a process. And we come out beautiful and resplendent. But it is a process. That's what Paul's talking about. Over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 24. Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness of truth. Remember, I told you, I looked at the pictures. Here's what I was. And I remember my secretary, after I had obeyed the gospel, she realized that there was a change in me and talked to me about it. And we were having a company uh, gathering. We had reached some goal that was set. And I said, okay, well, reserve the Coburg in uh, and out of my expense account, I'll take care of everybody's dinner. And everybody can go there, order whatever they want. I'll take care of it. And she said, is there going to be an open bar? I said, no. She said, but in the past, I go, that was the past. I'm a Christian now. I'm not going to do it. Well, it, it, it's the company that's actually paying. No, I have to sign the final, the final requisition. I will not do that. Man, Bruce, you've changed. I have. I have. Those things that were are no longer those things that are. So in that one instant, she really saw it in me. And over the next several months, as I began to go through the process of conversion, she saw more and more and more. And I would like to think that people that knew me way back when see in me even more of a change. I loved going up to Red Bluff a few years ago doing a gospel meeting. There was a woman there that, well, it was Mickey Kane, her husband, Bill, was the preacher where I was at in Coburg Road shortly after I was baptized. Larry Houchin had left and Bill and Mickey moved there to begin the work. And so I, I saw Mickey and I hadn't seen her for years. And it was so good to get caught up with her. And she took me aside and said, you've changed a lot. And I said, I hope it's been for the good. She said, yes, it has. I didn't ask her how I changed. But it was good to see that that change process was continuing. In each and every one of us, it's got to continue. Joy has been a Christian since when Napoleon was a private. But joy is going through changes. And that's the way it should be. We constantly grow and develop. We press on to maturity. But it is for us to look and to say it. And the changes I've seen in many over the years I've been here are all good. It's great. And I'm proud of you. And I challenge you to keep the good work. Do we love truth enough 
so that we can be vulnerable. Ah, I did there, good. So that we can be vulnerable. So that we can see ourselves as we really are. Realize that God is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That there is no creature hidden from his sight. And all things are open and laid bare with him with whom we have to do. That's what the writer of Hebrews points out in the fourth chapter, beginning in about verse 12. Now, the thing I think is kind of interesting. And you remember a little while ago, we went back to the prodigal son. And we saw how the prodigal son, in order to come back to his senses, he had to be broken. And he had to be broken again and again before he finally came to his senses. And then he realized what he needed to do. Then he made that resolve. Then he made the determination in order to really do what was necessary. So as we simply look at ourselves in the mirror, we have to ask the question, is that really me? Is that really the person I want to be? And I'm not talking about the mirror that is the reflection of the physical. I'm talking about the mirror of God's word, the reflection of those things that are spiritual. It's really hard to be totally, bluntly honest with ourselves. I it's hard. I can't say how hard it is for you. Because Paul even said, well, that's not our point. But I can only say how hard it is for me. It's hard. It's hard. Because I like to think of myself one way. But then when I look at myself, I go, oh, that, that can't be me. That can't be. But it is. Don't you hate it when you see a picture of yourself? I don't like to look at myself at all. Saw a picture of myself from when we went to Albuquerque to do a series of gospel meetings. I did not like what I saw. I looked at Linda. I said, who's Yabba the Hutt there? And she goes, that's you. And I'm, no, no, no. That ain't me. Yeah, it was. I went and tried out for preaching one time. And one of the questions that was asked on the handout, and I actually saw some of the responses. Does he look like a preacher? And one person said, no, he's too fat. And I go, well, I realized that I put a pound or two on over the years. But what does that have to do with preaching? But that's how that person saw me. The congregation was extremely superficial, I, got, I thought. Why would they even put that on there? Rather than, did he preach the truth? Did he do this? Did he do that? Needless to say, I didn't go to that congregation. But it was interesting. So it made me again stand back and say, well, how do people really see me? How do they see me? I guess the most important is not how people see me. Because if I'm being seen by God in an acceptable way, does it really matter how people see me? Because if I'm doing what God would have me to do, then ideally people see me as trying to be true and genuine. And I'll admit I'm a work in progress, as we all should be. Well, the lesson is yours this morning. I, I know today we drove down here and church building, church properties were full to the overflowing. It is, according to man's concept, it is Easter. And everybody goes to church on Easter. Not here. Uh, we're kind of down today, but we know a lot of people are gone. But this was not a, quote unquote, Easter sermon. And it wasn't intended to be. Because each and every first day of the week, we celebrate 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And because of that, we need to look at who we are and become the disciples he would want us to be. We're marching to Zion.